First of all, I want to thank Pedro and the society from Basque here to invite me to have this talk and to share our thoughts with you about physical activity and sport for persons with multiple sclerosis. When uh, Pedro asked me to do this and he said, you have, I give you 20 minutes, I first want to refuse it because 20 minutes is really not that much to explain all these things that I want to share and want to tell with you. But okay, we will try to do our best even if it's go a little bit quicker, so you can always uh, stop me and, and, and you can always do a sign to re-explain something again. So who am I? I am Paul Van As. I'm a physiotherapist specialized in neurology and in sports. I'm working already more than 30 years in the field of uh, multiple sclerosis. I have been 20 years the head of the, of the rehabilitation department in the National Multiple Sclerosis Center in Melsbrook in Brussels, which is one of the biggest M and oldest MS centers in Europe. We have there more than 140 beds for, on for inpatients, only of MS patients, only persons with MS. And we have a daily center there in Melsbrook where we treat around 100 patients a day on an ambulatory basis. I left that center in 2006 because I worked a lot in rehabilitation. I like to work, I admire to work uh, in the rehabilitation center, but I always was missing one step, and that was the step from the transfer from the rehab center to the patient at home. Because for me, what's the most important thing? It's what happened by patients at home. Because at home, with family, with friends, in the community, that's where life happens. We often had in our center that we have uh, treated persons with MS for three, four weeks, and we said afterwards, yes, on the 10-meter walking test, we can let them walk two seconds quicker. Nice work. Patients go back at home. They came at home. There were carpets, there were furniture, everything was in the way. They went to go and sit back into a wheelchair. So I was missing that step from transferring from what are we doing in our rehab centers to what are patients doing really at home and how can they use it, how we can transfer it. So I had at that time already my own private practice and I still have it. We are working with eight physiotherapists in combination with a fitness center and we do a lot of things there. Okay, but now the content of the presentation of today is what do we know about exercise therapy and sports for persons with MS? Because it's easy that I can say, yes, everybody has to do sports and you have to do this and you have to do that. But we need to have some research background for it. Do we have some evidence for it? Is it really true what we are telling you or what we are asking you? So and we will go quickly over this. And then I will present you the Move to Sport organization that we founded in 2009 in Belgium. And the projects that we are doing with them to promote an active lifestyle for persons with MS. Okay, let's think about uh, exercise therapy, sports and things like that. How can we see that? For me, if we had take the complete range from sports, then you have on one side of the range, you have the resistance training, which is strength training, which is force training. On the other hand, you have endurance training. That means that to do an effort to hold it for a long time. Everything here in between is often a combination of resistance and endurance training and this leads to these sports with their technical aspects on it. I know it's more than only resistance and endurance, you have also stability training, you have coordination training, there are tactics and so that are playing a role. But in fact, regarding the studies and the research that has been done for per persons with multiple sclerosis, it's especially at or with resistance training or with endurance training or a combination of both to see what can happen. We need to be honest, because all the studies that have been done until now, they were supervised con under supervised control conditions. What does that mean? That means that it happens or in a rehabilitation center, or somewhere in a place that a physiotherapist always was available. So these studies were practically not done by patients at home. And that's an important point, because they feel safe, they were supervised and they were controlled. Huh? The beneficial effects of exercise we most robustly demonstrated on motor function was on strength, physical fitness and walk, walking, and very important also on quality of life. 
which is a very an, uh, important aspect of this. Because strength, physical fitness and walking is okay, but this is for me more important quality of life. Okay? I prefer someone with less strength but with more quality of life than someone who is a bodybuilder with a, a very low quality of life. And most of these studies that I will present you now in, in a very briefly, they were done by persons with MS with a moderate disability. That means that they had an EDSS from 0 to or to maximum 5.5. You know what it is, the EDSS? So it's a, a scale that the neurologist is using to, let me say, to place all patients in a certain uh, way, so that he, if we hear about an EDSS 5.5, neurologist and somebody in the medical field knows what that means. That means that most of those persons are still able to walk for 100 meters or something like that. You say, eh? and we can go on like that, so, but this is important that you know that this place what is the first thing that I want to share with you, and for me is the most important one? It's safe. Exercises, sports, being physical active is safe. There is no higher risk for new relapses. Because a lot of patients, and certainly we, when we started it 10, 15 years ago with our projects, people were really afraid. We also had to convince neurologists about it, because they also were a little bit uh, afraid about that. But now it's, it's sure, and we can, we, we really have, the, it's proved already in many studies that there is no higher risk for new relapses. Uh, sorry to go back. Does it mean? that you don't feel anything while you are doing your sport, while you are training, while you are doing your exercises? Yes, because you can have a temporary increasing of your symptoms, and I will show you in the slide afterwards. Mostly that hold on for 30 minutes, that can be paresthesia, that can be fatigue. A lot of people are afraid to fatigue themselves. We, on the other side, we stimulate them to fatigue sometimes themselves. Because how can you build up some condition if you don't do a certain effort? It's a, a very important question that we are asking it. We even are starting now with higher intensity training levels. So in the beginning we were training on a very, very low level because a failure you have to avoid. You may never, never have a, a failure. So we start, we, now we are at the point, we are running now a project, which I will mention afterwards, where we're trying really with high, we were using high intensity training at, the, uh, at this time. As I told you that the, the, the symptoms can be temporary more increasing, this is uh, an exa, an, a test that we have done. What you here see, we ask two patients to do a maximum effort test for, for, for their sports to measure their condition. So in fact, we ask them to sit on a cycle and they have to cycle. They start cycling at a certain level with resistance. Every two minutes we add the resistance with a certain uh, wattage and at a certain moment they cannot go any further, so then we can see what is their uh, maximal effort position at that time. What did we do now? Before this started here, and they see that's we call T3 here, we give them 10 different symptoms that are often occurred uh, by uh, multiple sclerosis, like balance, dizziness, gait pattern, general fatigue, muscle fatigue, pain, weakness, sensory impairments, spasticity, and visual impairments. And we asked them to score them on a, on, a, on a scale from 1 to 10. It was a visual analog scale, you just have to point it what they feel about this symptom on a scale. Then, when they have finished their, uh, their effort, immediately after when they have finished, we re-ask the same question to fill it in. And you see, they all scored higher. And this was on a group, on a group of 44 patients that we did it. So it, 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 it's, it's quite a nice group. 15 minutes later, they re-scored it, and you see how it is decreasing. And at the end, after a half an hour, everything was practically on the same level. We contacted those people also the day after and two days after to see if they have had any problems also during the night, and in fact, they wasn't. So, this is to conclude to say that it's safe, but it's possible that you can feel while you are exercising some increasing of certain symptoms, but don't be afraid of that. That's, a, a, I think, a strong message that I want to give for you. Okay? 
Another thing is that, okay, it's nice to go to exercise, but how many times do we have to train? How, what's the intensity we have to do? What's the frequency? Do we have some guidelines about that? And yes, they are there, because it's often resistance, endurance, or a combined training. And the general guidelines about frequency and intensity for different types of exercise, they are existing, and we can compare them with the overall population. And I will show it you, to you in the next slide. So, be attentive for the symptoms, especially during and after the training. This is what I mentioned to you uh, just. So, what can we say regarding training guidelines? Huh? The intensity is very important. That means how much resistance will I take, how long will I run, and things like that. And what we know from physiology, from normal physiology, is that the training stimulus must be higher than a certain basic intensity. And why it needs to be? Because if you train below that intensity, that basic intensity, you're not increasing your condition. Nothing will change in your, in your body. So you have to move, you, you have to go uh, to a certain uh, level above the basic intensity. The American College of Sports and Medicine, which is uh, generally accepted to be, uh, let me say, the standard for this, they said, they said for persons with multiple sclerosis, it needs to be to 70 to 85% of their maximum heart frequency. What we said is that we start lower, because our experience is very clear that when pe persons with MS started with their physical activity and with their, with their uh, exercises, they are a little bit afraid, they are a little bit stressed of what will follow, what, will be the, what, can, be, what can that be caused. So we do it on a lower level. Why? Because I don't want any failure. If the patient or the person with MS had made the step to start to train and do some physical activity, then we need to see that it becomes a relative success. And that means if from the first session I put my intensity much too high and after two minutes we have to stop and patient go back home like this, then I, we failed. And it's very difficult to regain that afterwards. So, duration and frequency, two to three times a week, there we agree, two to three times a week for minimum 30 minutes or three times 10 minutes, that can be divided too. But do it on a regular basis, because we also know... Is it, was that a sign for me? Oh, no, I heard a peep though. <laughs> Maybe I was going over time, so... <laughs> and I'm just started, so sorry. <laughs> no, no, but what's important is that you have to do it on a regular basis, and we all know that feeling, because some now summer is coming, sun is shining, we take on our sport clothes and we say, I'm going to do a little jogging. But the first jogging that you do, you say, oh, I feel it, it's a couple of months ago that I didn't do it. And then you do it a couple weeks behind, one behind the other, and then you feel your conditioning is growing. So that means if you don't do it on a regular basis, all you build, all the, all the, all the condition that you have built up will go away very quickly, and it goes away much quicker than you build it up before. So be careful for that. What's also important is the specificity, and here I want to, 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 to say that adaptation in the body are sports and activity specific. That we'll want, I want to say with that if you always do the same movements and same repetition, you will good in that, but if you change it, then it becomes more difficult. So you need to train more skills, different skills. Yeah? And for me, if there is one thing that always in a physiotherapy program for persons with MS should be included, is endurance, strength and flexibility, with respect for everybody's possibilities. And that's very important, because now with the new medication, with patients who are early, the diagnosed earlier in better condition, but you also have at this time the people who are sitting in a wheelchair who don't have the same possibilities. But nevertheless, also people who are sitting in wheelchairs can do endurance and strength training. That's very important, that they know that it's not, oh no, this is not for me anymore because I'm not able to run anymore. No, it's still possible, but it's on another level and we will make another objective for that, okay? Your program should be flexible. What about recuperation and individualization? So there is not a real standardization and it should be individualized by most of us. And as I told you already several times, no failure for starting up a program. 
Is there an impact on cognitive function? Yes, until what we have seen until now, yes. There are some nice publications about from Bricken, from Calron, and uh, in 2016 from Sandroff, where they say that active exercising and the impact on cognitive function, such as it should have an impact on attention and alertness, visual spatial memory, and information processing speed. I'm not a specialist in, co in uh, cognitive uh, function or cognitive therapy, so I will not go out of it, but this is really what we found already in the, li in the literature about this. And then, the big question for maybe, I think, for the next years, and it will also very go uh, pass by, by the next presentation that you will hear regarding technology and things like that, because the question is, is there an impact of active exercising of moving on the brain itself? Can we influence the brain by moving or exercising? And I think we have to be convinced about that it's possible. And I think that there are not so many people who will contradict that, but to influence it, to have an effect on the volume, on the structure, on connectivity, you need to, you need to be active, you need to move, you need to use your brain. So, and that can also be done by, act, by physical activities. Then you have also the concept of motor reserve that is described not so, so long ago. And motor reserve will say that if you're starting to move and you, have to, to, you can increase your condition, you will have some kind of reserve in your brain that you can use later on when it will be decreasing. So I think it's always an also a very uh, interesting theme and where in the next 10, 15 years we will read a lot about and hear a lot about. Yeah? And then also, do we have something, what do we know about the lifestyle intervention? Because there it's go about. We know that if you do exercise therapy, that can give you a temporary booster. But the word temporary is very important here, because it's nice to have it temporary, but it's how can you keep it up? How can we go on? And therefore, adherence is one of the main topics for this moment, and I know neurologists have also this problem, how can patients can st uh, will, will stay on their disease-modifying drugs, because some people also stop with them, and it's the same for rehabilitation. You have to try to keep them on the track. Yeah? Behavioral change with inclusion of active exercises in your weekly rhythm, so try to put it in, in your weekly rhythm. It's possible with other recreative sports because it doesn't have to be with machines or things like that and that you will see if I come to the move to sport. For me, an active lifestyle, it's more important if you participate than that you do really only your focus on your sports. And also M Health can, can help you, but I will not tell you a, a, not too much about that because that's for the next presentation. So in fact, this we can stimulate patients to work in our practice and in our cabinet, and we hope that they can transform it to bring it out and to participate and to do it in, in the real life. Okay? M Health, I will not say too much about, but you know that you have now so many things like Fitbit, like Polar Horologies, where you can create uh, a platform and you can follow patients from distance and see what they have done, and especially what they haven't done. So, uh, but but there, there are a lot of possibilities, and but we will not go for this. Uh, the potential barriers of participation in sports. That means the barriers that are the things that. It's a little bit oppose you to, to start. Eh? You have internal and external factors, physical symptoms. You see, it's, 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 it's all very clear here if you read them. I'm not going to pass one by one. External factors. And this is one that we experienced also 15 years ago. Opposition also of neurologists, opposition of generalists and, and things like that. We experienced that. And it's true, I can understand it, because at that time of the moment, we didn't know, we had not that much research and that background that we have for the moment. And for the moment, we have it, so I think we have to go for it and we will continue with it. So it's really an opportunity. Okay, but there are also factors that can facilitate participation, and they are a little bit the opposite of what we saw. But this is also a very important one, the social support from spouse, from family, from friends and things, that can be a very important one. 
Okay, this is what we know until now from exercise therapy. Now I will go a little bit quicker maybe about this. This is an organization that's called Move to Sport that we founded in 2009. And why did we start it? Because, as I told you, there was the lack of, of uh, sport and exercise possibility for persons with MS in Belgium to do it in the community. They have to go or to the medical environment, to a hospital or to a rehab center. And we want to bring, take it out of the medical environment and let them go to, to sports centers, to swimming pools, and that they can go there with friends and family. And, and, and then we said, we analyzed the problem and we said, okay, but what do we need? First of all is the expertise. We need expert, ex professionals who are working in the community and who have the expertise to do this, to guide those persons. Okay? And then we started with education days, with workshops. And now for the moment, as I told you, we have around 180 professionals that we have. We do also research, we do a lot of awareness projects, and we have also a Walk for MS that we are organizing. But the organization aims to promote and stimulate an active lifestyle in people with MS. You see, active lifestyle, it's really in bold, regardless of the degree of disability, eh? because it's for the, all, the overall population and under expert guidance. Okay? The education and network for healthcare professionals that we build up on exercise and sport for persons with MS. So we have this network now and we, I can say it really works. It's used by the MS society because people with MS are phoning to the MS society and say, hello, I'm living there, I'm diagnosed with MS, where can I find somebody who can, who, that you can recommend me? So they send him to, to, to the, the guy who is living in that area. Neurologists are using it, eh? so and it's, it's in fact it's really a nice network that has been used that is being used. Okay, and then we have the engaging project for creating awareness. We did a trek to Machu Picchu in 2012, eh? where we went with 10 persons with MS, 10 persons with MS who never have believed when we asked them the first time to participate in this project that they ever would don't would do this in their life. But for all the projects that we do, it's very clear, we test them beforehand, they have to make a training program from four to six months, we retest them, and then we go and do our objective. So it was really a very nice experience with those people. 2012, we went to Jordania, uh, then we did a trek uh, in the Wadi Rum desert for uh, one week, and then we explored completely Petra, we slept there outside with no tents, just in sleeping bags. During the day in the desert it was 30 degrees, during the night it was below zero that it went. But it was a very nice experience and great experience. Then we did the MS Run project, we had 40 patients who were still able to walk 5 kilometers, but who never has done any jogging or running. So we trained them up for four months and we start them then to let them run five kilometers. And after four months, they all participated in a public event in Brussels, in the 20 kilometers of Brussels, where they, they run the five kilometers. Yeah? The new challenge that we are doing now and we are working on now is the MS versus Mont Ventoux challenge. It's a cycling challenge. And there we were a little bit afraid because we were looking for 20 persons uh, who, who would be candidate to participate and we were a little bit afraid. But we had to stop at 23 because otherwise we would have 50 and that the budget would, could not reach that. So here we, do a, we will do also a trial, a double blind random mouse control trial with 23 persons with MS and 23 healthy control uh, persons. We did the pre-testing already in February. They are training now six months until the end of August and the beginning of September. In the first 15 days of September, we will do the post-testing, and then at the 16th of September, we will go with the whole group and with some uh, supporters to the Mont Ventoux, and we will climb it there. The training that they're doing is periodizing, and that means that they are training in blocks of three weeks. The first week is endurance training, nothing than endurance training, training, from two, training sessions from two hours and more. The second week is high-intensity training. That means very short session, but go with with a very, very high intensity, and the third week is recuperation. Then we start again, okay? 
they trained with the Polar and we have a, co we have a coaching platform and they are taking some supplements uh, versus placebo and we will see what will be the effect of it. Okay? This is the group, we have also a group training and you see how they all are smiling and it, so they, they, now they are still smiling. I think when we will climbing the Mont Ventoux, the smiling will be a little bit less, I think. Okay. What's important is that with all these things you need to reach, you need to get visibility. Because it's nice to do all these things and if you do them for 10 persons with a mess, it's good for them. But you need to reach the press, you need to, 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 to reach the, the, the journals and, and everything like that. So with our project at this time, we have already over 100 journal articles. And what's always, what we always do is because I get a lot of phones from journalists and they say, can you tell me your organization? I said, no. Here are some numbers of, of persons with MS and call them and write their story because that's what you need to tell. That's what people want to read and they don't want to read well, who is Paul Van Us because they don't care about that. They care about what are other pe uh, persons with MS experiences and how did they lift this project. Okay? I need to acknowledge two of my best friends and also colleagues, huh? Peter Feijs, some of you will already know them, and Bert Optende. We are working together in this for this organization already for from in the beginning. And now uh, I want to start this video. I don't know how I have to start it. Yes, this is when we went to to Petra when we uh, to Peru when we came back. The, the persons themselves, they wrote together with one of the participants the text of this song and also the music. So I think if we can maybe do, uh, do out the lights a little bit more, that would be nice. And also that the sound would be... Uh, oh, it don't work. I will try to restart. Maybe a little harder. Try to read the words also of the text. Not long ago I thought my life had ended You hit me right between the eyes Took me quite a while to recover But I'm back on track to everyone's surprise I feel there's a whole lot more inside me With some effort and some help I still can grow Mountain ain't a problem but a challenge And from the top I let everybody know we go climbing, climbing for a goal We go climbing, climbing for a goal Load is steep, the air is thin around us Clouds hide the dangers all on the way Together we will make it to the summit Side by side we won't be led astray I feel there's a whole lot more inside me With some effort and some help I still can grow Mountain ain't a problem but a challenge From the top I let everybody know we go climbing, climbing for a goal We go climbing, climbing for a goal We go climbing, climbing for a goal Can I have the light, please? Yeah, so I think if you uh, read the text, you have saw the, the images, I think I can come to my overall conclusion. And this lady that will bring you the conclusion is traveling already so many years with me with all my presentations. 
And she always brings the end conclusions and the take-home messages. So when she, now she say that exercise is safe and it's beneficial for persons with MS. And it may be fun, it should be fun maybe. Eh? So don't give up too easy and therefore I want to thank you for your attention.